Hello, and welcome to our webcast. I'm Jamie Pennington with Moss Adams, and I'm going to get us started for today's session, Equity, Diversity, and Access in Healthcare, a conversation with Dr. Gerald E. Harmon of the American Medical Association. Before we begin, I'm going to play a brief housekeeping video. Welcome, and thanks for joining us. We're pleased to present another in our ongoing series of continuing professional education webcasts to help companies and individuals conquer challenges as they plan for what's next. Our presentation will start in a few moments. Before we begin, here are a few things to keep in mind. You can customize how you both view our presentation and interact with the presenter. For better viewing, close all other applications and turn up your speaker volume. You can also adjust window size and placement or enter full screen mode using the controls at the top of the window or dragging the bottom right hand corner to resize. At the bottom of your screen, you'll see a series of icons each relating to a different aspect of our session. You can download the group attendance sheet and a PDF copy of today's slides from the slide deck and handouts widget to the right of the slide view. You can ask our presenter questions during the webcast by typing a question in the Q&A window below the slide view and clicking submit. We'll do our best to answer all questions during the presentation or follow up via email. If you experience technical difficulty during today's presentation, refresh your browser by hitting the F5 key. Today's session will offer you one CPE credit. To receive credit, you must meet the requirements as specified by the National Association of State Boards of Accountancy. You must attend at least 50 minutes of the session and respond to at least 75% of the polling questions, which we'll ask throughout today's presentation. To respond to a poll, click the button next to your answer. We'll track your progress and alert you when you've earned CPE credit. You can then click the certificate icon in the CPE progress widget to open a PDF file that you can save to your computer. Don't worry if you can't download your PDF certificate today. We'll email a copy to you in two weeks. If you're attending this webcast in a group, you must complete our attendance sheet to receive CPE credit. The attendance sheet is available in the slide deck and handouts widget. Please have all group members sign it and send only one sheet per group. Also note that CPE credit can be awarded only to participants registered as themselves and isn't available to participants who view the on-demand version. As a reminder, the presentation you're about to see isn't legal, investment, or accounting advice. We encourage you to seek the counsel of a professional service provider to apply this content to your specific circumstances. And now I would like to turn the floor over to today's moderator, Shante Kinch, Director at Moss Adams. Shante? Thank you, Jamie, and welcome everyone. As stated, my name is Shante Kinch. I'm a director at Moss Adams. I am a self-proclaimed bias disruptor uh, with over 20 years in continuous improvement and 12 years in healthcare. But today is not about me. I am pleased to welcome our guest of honor, Dr. Gerald E. Harmon. He is the 176th president of the American Medical Association. He is a family medical medicine uh, provider in South Carolina, where he's been practicing for over 30 years. He's held other uh, roles in the AMA, such as the board of trustees, the board chair, as well as secretary. Thank you so much for joining us today, Dr. Harmon. Well, thank you. Thank you. All right. Oops. All right, so today what we're gonna do, we are going to, um, Hear from Dr. Harmon first. He's going to talk about tackling diversity, equity, and inclusion in healthcare. And then we're going to have a conversation and uh, just talk and ask some questions. Your questions are welcome. As mentioned, please enter them in the Q&A section of your screen, and we'll get to as many of those as we can. Today, we have with us over 400 registrants from over 43 states from coast to coast. Most attendees are from California, 128, followed by Washington and then Texas, but we also have some East Coasters on there. Hello, friends. We're welcoming folks from across the healthcare continuum. We have 181 attendees from hospitals and health systems, 45 from medical groups and physician practices, 44 ancillary and 38 from health plans. We also have a number of attendees from tech, tribal and gaming, private equity and nonprofit. Roles range from senior and executive vice presidents, C-suite board chairs, and we're even happy to have with us a chief kindness officer, a cultural and linguist, 
Lynn, I can't even say it, <laughs> linguistics specialist and a lean transformation officer. Uh, we have a number of people ranging from reimbursement, strategic planning, employee benefits and community health, tax and accounting. And this shows that people from all levels are very engaged and committed to breaking down longstanding barriers of equity, diversity, and inclusion in healthcare. So welcome everyone. We're gonna start with a polling question. Turn it back to Jamie. Our first polling question is, what brings you to today's webinar? A, I wanna take lessons back to my colleagues or organization. B, I want to learn more about operationalizing racial equity. C, I'm not sure where to begin on operationalizing racial equity. D, here for the CPE. E, all of the above, or F, none of the above. I'll give you a few moments to respond. To respond, please click the button next to the answer you choose and hit submit. If you can't see the submit button, please enlarge the slide area. As a reminder, if you would like to receive CPE credit for today's webcast, you will need to respond to at least three of the four polling questions. Looks like there's still some answers coming in. Go ahead and view the results. Shantae, back to you. Thank you. There were a few people also that mentioned that they are not able to see the question. So maybe we can get that fixed in the background. All right, so most people are here for all of the above. <laughs> a few people are here just to get that CPE credit, and that's okay too. Hopefully you'll learn something important and applicable while you're here. Um, but there are a lot of people that wanna take things back to their organization as well as how to operationalize racial equity. So we'll make sure that we get to some very specific questions and around that um, so that we can leave with some action steps and things that we can apply. So thank you everyone for your participation. Now we will turn it over to Dr. Harmon. Well, thank you, Shante. I, I really appreciate that. And on behalf of the American Medical Association, it's a real pleasure to be here. I, uh, I'm i excited to do it. I'm excited about what we're able to do and today. It's, it's an honor to join you. Uh, as you heard, I'm a family physician in uh, rural South Carolina for more than 30 years, and it's well more than 30 years, and I'm just tickled to be here today. You know, it's difficult to put into words how far we've come during the past 24 months. Almost 24 months to the day, uh, we closed a lot of things down. So it, how much has the world changed because of COVID-19? A lot. We're not yet at the end of the pandemic. We're trending in the right direction. Our healthcare workforce, from physicians and nurses to support staff and other personnel, have been extraordinary in helping us turn the tide against the deadly virus. They sacrificed a lot in their service to the country and, and time and time again, they've answered the call at great personal risk to themselves and to their loved ones. Before I begin my presentation, I want to extend my most sincere thank you to any healthcare worker who might be on today's call. I'm truly honored to call you my colleagues, my, uh, my soldiers in this war against the COVID virus and to your dedication to preserving public health. Your, your dedication to public health is what inspires me every day. Let's talk a little bit about uh, the impact of disadvantage on quality of life. Uh, let's talk about inequities in healthcare and how this too is an urgent healthcare crisis. Well, I'd like to go, we need to work collectively to address it. Access to quality healthcare is only one aspect of healthy living. There's research by the Kaiser Family Foundation and others that identifies a number of social determinants that could impact a person's health and well-being. Things such as socio socioeconomic status, education, mobility, employment opportunities, transportation infrastructure, the overall environmental quality and many other factors. And of course, genetics can play a role as well. A combination of these factors is the primary reasons why Latinx, Black, Indigenous, and historically marginalized communities suffer much higher rates of chronic illness, including diabetes, heart disease, and obesity compared to other groups. It's a big reason why these same marginalized communities have suffered so disproportionately during the COVID pandemic. The CDC's own research from this past fall indicated that people of Hispanic, Black, and Native American ancestry are almost three times as likely to die from COVID-19 and four times as likely to be hospitalized as white patients. So understanding the impact of social determinants of health on a person's chances for a long and a healthy life is critical. The AMA is considering social determinants of health as part of our overall strategy to improve health outcomes of patients on a broad scale and to bring about quality health access across the system. This factors, these factors are influencing our work in digital technology as well as medical 
education and training of physicians. About six years ago, in 2016, the AMA published a textbook on a health system science, which we call the third pillar of medical education. It, uh, it uh, brings uh, aspiring young physicians to topics such as healthcare delivery, the social and ecological developments of health and population health. The curriculum was developed as part of our work to reinvent medical education and it's already in use now in more than a dozen medical schools. You know, AMA, I, I believe, and AMA believes that fulfilling our mission of promoting the art and science of medicine and the betterment of public health requires us to use our resources, our influence, our power to push toward a more equitable future. It's important to note that in order to achieve this, AMA does not endorse or embrace any single theory or perspective. We look at the significant body of scientific evidence on how we can reduce health disparities. There's two key principles of our code of medical ethics that guides our work on health equity. First of all, we are to provide, and I quoted from the screen here, competent medical care with compassion and respect for human dignity and rights. We're also to respect the law, but recognize our responsibility to seek changes when it's contrary to the best interests of our patients. There are unfortunately racist systems and discriminatory structures that create and maintain health inequities for historically oppressed individuals and communities. This is unjust, unacceptable, and it's avoidable. Without system level and structural change, health inequities will persist. Marginalized communities will continue to be disproportionately impacted and the health of the nation is gonna to continue to suffer. AMA House of Delegates at special meeting we just had in 2020, it was a virtual meeting. Our leadership pledged to take action on racism, on healthcare and society. Specifically, we reiterated our position that we recognize racism is an urgent threat to public health, the advancement of health equity, and a barrier to excellence in the delivery of medical care. We oppose all forms of racism and denounce police brutality and all forms of racially motivated violence. We will actively work to dismantle racist and discriminatory policies, discriminatory policies and practices across all health care. Our policy at the AMA also recognizes that physical or verbal violence between law enforcement officers and the public, particularly among black, brown and black communities where these incidents are most prevalent and pervasive, it's a determinant, a critical determinant of health. And the AMA commits to actively working on dismantling racist discriminatory policies and practices all across health care. And it's calling on political leaders to make systemic changes in the nation's criminal, criminal justice system. We, uh, the, we created a Center for Health Equity in 2019. It helps facilitate, strengthen, and amplify the American Medical Association's work to eliminate health inequities that are rooted in historical and contemporary racial oppression. This is led by our Chief Health Equity Officer and Senior Vice President, Dr. Letha Maybank. The center actively works to dismantle racist and discriminatory policies and practices and to help remove the most common barriers that keep historically marginalized communities from accessing the care they need during this pandemic. This center has been the driving force for most of the AMA's work around racial justice and equity. It includes, a, a, I'll list a couple of things, a medical justice and advocacy fellowship program it's a partnership with Morehouse School of Medicine, Satcher Leadership Institute, the, inauguration, it, the inaugural Medical Justice and Advocacy Fellowship is a collaborative educational initiative that empowers physician advocacy to advance health equity for marginalized communities. We have invested $2 million in the West Side United Partnership. It's Chicago's West Side United. It builds alliances with organizations, groups, and neighborhoods that have experienced historical disinvestment. We have a Health Equity Resource Center on the AMA Educational Hub on our website. We have built in uh, there on our, uh, our work to reimagine medical education to tackle some of the biggest challenges in healthcare. We advocate for health equity uh, medical education opportunities, see continuing medical education uh, credit to provide a greater understanding of the determinants and the drivers of health. We actually teamed up with the Association of American Medical Colleges to create a guide to language, narrative, and concepts. We introduced this this past June. It creates a toolkit for physicians and all healthcare workers. It provides guidance on equity focus, person first language, and why knowledge, why language matters. We created the Prioritizing Equity Spotlight Series. It's a, uh, a series of uh, examining the role of AMA and others in organized medicine. And it helps uh, explain historically why we have the unequal healthcare system that exists today. We talk about our AMA plan to embed racial equity. In the spring of this past year, in May of uh, 2021, we embedded this plan to embed racial justice and advance health equity. It's, it's a three-year, multi-year strategy to carry out all of our work. 
about five years ago when I was AMA board chair, when I became board chair in 2017, I appointed a health equity task force to explore mm -hmm. health inequities, what caused them, and to return one year later with the specific instructions and a plan forward on how we could help address health inequities. Those recommendations that were combined with the strong backing with the AMA House of Delegates, as well as the AMA board and senior management, led to the creation of the AMA Center for Health Equity and the development over the past two years of an organizational-wide strategy that um, a health equity plan that we had released. Now, this, this is, make no mistake about it, this strategic plan is not a credit to me or any special wisdom I had on these issues. It's a credit to all these people and wonderful organizations that have helped shape our thinking on this, on informed us, who guided us and led us to a place where we believe we can make a difference. The plan has five strategic approaches. You see them there uh, to, begin tackling, to begin tackling these challenges. Number one, we want to embed equity and racial justice throughout the AMA. We expanded our capacity for understanding and implementing anti-racist equity strategies, fair practices, programming, policies, and a culture. We want to build alliances with marginalized physicians and other stakeholders, organizations. Uh, we want to push upstream to, invest, to address all the social determinants of health and the root causes of inequities. And we want to ensure equitable structures and opportunities exist in innovation through our existing efforts to advance digital health and telemedicine. And finally, we want to foster pathways for truth, racial healing, and reconciliation about the own past and exclusionary practices of the American Medical Association. Bold plan, in my opinion. This past fall, uh, we launched a, in collaboration with the AAMC, the American Association, Associated American Medical Colleges, a toolkit to support physicians' conversations with the patients. We, help, we hope we can help promote a deeper understanding of equity focus, first person language, and why words matter. Many see an equity focused language as maybe just an attempt at being politically correct. However, I think about it, and I urge anybody on our conversation today to think about it differently. Our words matter because trust is foundational in the physician-patient relationship. And, and, and if we have the right amount of trust and people really believe that we're in it for their best interest, it, it can save someone's life, literally. But AMA, we recognize there are limitations in language. Uh, current language and narratives have been deeply rooted in value systems and ingrained in cultural practice that have given preference to the interests of society's most powerful social groups, but they can even be wielded as a weapon to oppress uh, others. Now, let's, in, in, in I, as I read through this guide, as I think about it, there's just a few words we can think about. You know, instead of saying the word, this patient, the 34-year-old male who's an ex-con or a convicted felon, why don't we say formerly incarcerated? It says the same thing, but it doesn't have the negative stigmatism of ex-con or a felon. Instead of saying an illegal, why not use undocumented immigrant? It really puts us in a, 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 a better position. And instead of saying minority, maybe we should say historically marginalized, because that really is where we are. We've historically marginalized many folks, uh, many of my colleagues, my neighbors, other American citizens. You know, these non dominant narratives in American medicine and even in society have reflected the interests and the values of historically more privileged social, social economic groups. That's a fact, not just a concept. As with, saying, as with science, any of our language and uh, uh, must change, and it, it's got to evolve over time based on the deeper understanding and education and experience. In order to get all this work in equity we, uh, to become effective, we need to improve physician training. It begins with educating physicians on the issues and the research that helps explain why inequities exist and how they can bridge those gaps, the kind of information that I didn't necessarily receive in medical school decades ago. So the AMA has developed a groundbreaking series of continuing education modules for the on what we call our website, the AMA Ed Hub. It better trains doctors and medical students on the root causes of health inequities, including racism and other structural determinants of health. There's a lot of new modules that offer a deep dive on health equity issues, include training and resources, and a champion, becoming how to become a champion of equity-centered innovation. We have a, an AMA Journal of Ethics. We released a two-part series this past year on racial and ethnic health equity in the U.S., it focused on inequities and a morbidity, mortality, and access to services that are unfortunately endemic to American life. We've produced more than 30 episodes of a, a digital CME accredited prioritizing equity video series. Uh, it provides insights and analysis on how COVID-19 particularly and other determinants of health are impacting marginalized communities and they negatively impact public health and adversely impact health equity. I want to talk about our uh, innovation and education. It, these things are crucial to moving towards health equity. I really believe at my very core that education and innovation 
uh, and technology can play a big role towards advancing health equity. You know, there were almost $11 billion of venture capital investing in health startups in 2019 alone. And a lot of resources committed to innovation in large healthcare and health focused tech companies. The health innovation sector has an incredible potential, potential to advance health equity. You know, the total economic gain that could be associated with reducing racial health disparities alone is over $130 billion a year, almost $135 billion annually. That's a gain in, in, in expenses that we can use much better to help advance uh, so many other parts of healthcare in America. We've created the External Equity and Innovation Advisory Group. It advises us on the Ensure Equity and Innovation Strategic Approach. It's laid out in our multi-year health equity plan. And this advisory group is made up of diverse perspectives and characteristics of our members who are selected based on individual expertise and experience, not as a representative of a particular institution, association, or company. And this advisory group has four main objectives, to embed racial justice and health equity within existing AMA innovation efforts, to center, integrate, and ampli amplify historically marginalized and minoritized patients, innovators, and investors in health innovation, to engage in cross-sector collaboration advocacy efforts, and to equip the healthcare innovation sector to advance equity and justice. We have quarterly meetings. We have regular communication. Now, this group, advisory group, provides our AMA Center for Health Equity, uh, our leadership team, and other internal AMA equity innovation stakeholders with thought leadership, with expert analysis, strategic guidance, and support for external stakeholder engagement and communication. Pretty ambitious goal, but we're trying to literally put our money and our invest and our efforts where our mouth is. This is more than just words and thoughts and talk. We want to have an executable plan. I want to uh, I want to thank you. Uh, I know I've had a lot to discuss on it. the opportunity to be here and to highlight some of the ways AMA is helping advance racial justice and health equity through our programs and our initiatives, educating doctors and medical students about inequities and how to address them. Uh, there is a, 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 we have a website, ama-assn.org. You click under that website, you go to health equity, you learn all about it, learn about my media statements, learn about our health equity plans, or find out about our, our work groups and what's going on. It's just a lot of ground to cover. Uh, I'm honored to be here. Shante is uh, going to be taking over here, and I'm available to answer questions that Shante may have and end the questions and advisory uh, in the Q&A session. Uh, Again, I think it's an honor to be a doctor. It's an honor to be a member and president of the AMA. And an honor to be invited to this prestigious, prestigious group. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Harmon. All right, before we get going into our questions and answers, we're going to do another polling question. Our second polling question is, have you personally experienced or witnessed racial or gender injustice in healthcare? And your answer options are A, yes, or B, no. I would like to take this time to remind you to submit your questions for the presenters in the Q&A window. We do have quite a bit of content to cover today, so if we don't have time to respond during the webcast, we will do our best to follow up with you afterwards. It looks like there's still some answers coming in, so we'll give it a little bit more time. We'll go ahead and look at the results. Interesting. All right, so we have about 58% of people saying no and 42% of people saying yes. Um, I absolutely have. Um, this has been a topic of conversation for me personally um, over the last years. I've had to have some, some medical um, care and it was clear to me and blatant to me what was going on. So I'm very passionate about this topic um, and, but it's good to, to see where we all are, um, as we, as we do these polls. All right. So we are going to transition to a conversation. All right. So I want to start off with, um, Dr. Harmon mentioned that in 2019, the center for health equity was launched in 2021. You all published a strategic plan. Um, I've spent, you know, a, a bit of time 
uh, reading all of your information and, and it's, it's very informative and great. Your strategic plan was refreshingly transparent regarding past harm that AMA has caused towards Asian Americans, Latin, Native Americans, Latinx, African Americans, LGBTQ+, and anti-Semitism. Um, but like I said, you all have been, have been launching a lot of initiatives and making bold statements regarding equity since 2019. Why now? Well, I think, I hope uh, you understand, or I understand that uh, one of the things that our mission statement says, we improve the advance of uh, advanced art and science of medicine to better in public health. That's just so apparent to me, that's that's what we're here for. That's why I took those to become a doctor is advance public health and better public health. I can't do that when I live in an era that historically uh, we've seen that uh, mar disproportionately impacts under uh, represented marginalized communities. I see this uh, to the first polling question. I see it in my own practice uh, periodically where uh, a patient of color and from a marginalized part of my community and a uh, substantial part of rural South Carolina is indeed uh, marginalized and has been for hundreds of years. We see uh, uh, disparities in delivery of care, disparities in access to care. I take an oath to take care of everybody. Doctors do all of that. The AMA has historically and participatory in this and discriminatory practice. A uh, hundred years ago, the AMA did not allow non-white physicians and non-male physicians to become a member. A hundred years ago, the only way to get credentialed to deliver health care and license and appropriately allowed to practice in hospitals was to be a member of the AMA. So other uh, oppressive, uh, those oppressive reasons caused other Hispanic medical associations, national medical associations to be founded because we as an, as an institution wouldn't allow participation by people who were taking the same kind of oath that we did. Uh, this is a, clearly you, you got me, Shantae, you got me gendered up or uh, engineered up to do it, putting the engineering hat on. I mean, I, this is mechanically, uh, engineeringly, uh, instructively important for me to take an active step. And as I said, 2017, when I was the board chair, our, our organization said, we need to do better. We need to have an actionable plan. And not just talk about it. We need to have something that puts some, mar uh, some metrics in line we have that 84 page document, our strategic plan, that we're trying to live to and address and make uh, actionable differences in. There's a sense of urgency. And then COVID released the seriousness of what a pandemic could do and disproportionately affect, including death and, and mortality and morbidity three to four times more often in non-white patients. Clearly, this isn't just a, a theory, this is the science and the reality. So it's appropriate and, and I think imperative that we address this now. Thank you. And I see I see a bunch of questions starting to come in. So keep them coming. We're gonna we're gonna try to get to those. The one thing that everybody on this call has in common is that we're all patients. Dr. Harmon, how does the plan get from paper to practice to providers on the front line? You know, that we I think we're trying to make sure that we understand first off that the plan isn't just something to uh, to just start checking the boxes. We need to do more than check the boxes. We need to educate. And I think you understand and we understand and I understand looking at the plan. Uh, what we have to do is first educate ourselves. That number one, there is a problem. You, you saw our first question where half the folks uh, who responded, the polling respondents said they witnessed and experienced uh, adverse uh, application of health care depending on uh, uh, racial, uh, uh, ethnic, or gender barriers, and that's inappropriate. We need to treat every patient as, a, as an individual person. It's also why we embedded our person first language that we talked about. We need to think about people as a person with a disease, not a disease in a person. So everybody needs to be person first, person centric, and our application of healthcare needs to be that way. Again, I'll I, I tell you my uh, uh, recent experience, just a couple of weeks ago, I was in the hospital working in the emergency room, and I had one of my younger doctors come in and say, hey, a patient in uh, room seven is a 34-year-old uh, drug addict who's here with a skin infection. And I said, hey, well, hold on. What you have here is a 34-year-old male or a 34-year-old patient or 34-year-old female patient. Well, you can perhaps use that, but it's a 34-year-old patient that's recovering and has a problem with substance use disorder that is concerns about being sick. You don't need to use the disparaging term and, and I think stigmatizing term 
of drug addict, you need to think this through. On, from the patient first perspective, this is a 34 year old patient that has substance use disorder, or they might have seizures. They might be uh, uh, a person with diabetes, but you don't need to say this is a 34 year epileptic, 34 year asthmatic or diabetic. This is a 34 year old person with diabetes and substance use disorder. Uh, and, and then that gets the narrative to be in person first. It really, I think it changes the entire way we not only think about people, but perhaps the way we should be treating them and improving their health outcomes. Thank you. There was a question about person first language. So I think that just answered that as well. Yeah, I saw that. And I, I think that was very important because, you know, and let me tell you, doctors don't think this way. They don't tell us that in medical school. We don't have any education about how to address patients. We just, you know, we learn about the science. We learn about all the basic science. Then we get thrown in with a white coat and a stethoscope and say, go be a doc for the next couple of years of medical school. But if we can start early on and respect who the patients are, not just what the disease is, but the person with that disease, I think it can approach our entire, I think it can impact our entire approach to treatment and diagnosing folks. Thank you. So as you, as you mentioned, education, the AMA guide says, uh, that the biological narrative of race has permeated the country's social institution for centuries. In 2020, you all declared that racism is a threat to public health and committed to end racial essentialism in medicine, confirming that race as a social construct, not a biological one, and ridding race as a proxy for biology, ancestry, and genetics. That's huge. How prevalent do you think racial essentialism is in education and the mindset of providers? And what place, if any, does critical race theory have in medical education? Large, complex question. And I get I get the approach with that, and I've been approached with it since May of this past year when we came out and broadcast uh, appropriately our uh, uh, guide to advancing uh, health equity. We, we are not taught racial essentialism in medical school, at least I wasn't. We're trying to improve that right now. We are, as we talk about in my, uh, in my slide deck, I'm not embracing one particular narrative or theory. Critical race theory is a, in my opinion, a, a potential vehicle for addressing a, a transparent conversations, uh, difficult conversations, but address the reality that racial disparities uh, do uh, exist, adverse health outcomes do exist, and we need to address the fact that race is really a, a social construct. They're biologically DNA-wise, DNA we're all about 99.9% .9 the same. So there may be some genetic complications, no question of that. We, we recognize that genetics plays a part. But race shouldn't be a part of that. What we need to understand is that uh, we have inherent biases. Society has inherent biases. We talk about the language uh, document. If we can get past uh, our uh, historically uh, taught and experienced, lived experiences from uh, the majority perspective, then I think it will, and there's no question that it, what it will do is advance trust and transparency between a physician and the patient that will help uh, address the uh, disparity that we see when uh, persons of color, black or brown patients, seem to have a better result when their providers are a similar uh, uh, background. It, you know, there should not be a reason, uh, there's no scientific reason for me to explain why a, uh, a woman might have four times worth, uh, four times worth outcomes in pregnancy if, if she's a black woman versus a white woman, given the same uh, other adjusted factors. We've got to think that through. That science, that fact has to be addressed, has to be thoughtfully, thoughtfully applied, and then we need to come up with uh, operations and uh, expectations to improve it. One of the things we know is that we need to improve the workforce uh, mix. I need to see more black males in American medicine, American medical school. That's why we're partnering with Morehouse and uh, historically black institutions to make sure that we can get a larger, more diverse workforce with 30% of America's population uh, being from uh, uh, historically marginalized communities and only 12% of America's physicians, 13% of America's physici physicians in that workforce that's a disparity that we need to address. I think we can need to get more uh, black and Hispanic, Latinx, and indigenous, indigenous Americans into the physician workforce. And that's what AMA is trying to push for. And, and make sure that 
they're educated when they're in medical school and they can bring their lived experiences to other patients and other providers. That's a win-win for all of us. I was just about to ask, what are you all doing to make that better? So I'm happy to hear about the partnership with the HBCUs and et cetera. There was a question um, on, on the lines of this around wanting some clarity on what did you mean by genetic diversity? Can you explain what that means for our audience? Well, uh, now here, I guess what I would say is there's some genetic diversity, but we're, I don't, I saw the question too. I don't want to imply that uh, there will be, uh, uh, to include genetic differences uh, will imply uh, 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 genetic uh, uh, risk. That's, that's not true. I agree with that. What I'm saying, though, there are some genetic diseases that are chromosomal in nature uh, that are uh, uh, related to X and Y chromosomes, things like that, that we have to address. But that's not necessarily racial. Those are genetic, and that's not the same uh, argument. So uh, let's let's make sure that we don't can ignore the fact that let, let's say um, uh, mucoviscidosis, cystic fibrosis, overwhelmingly seen historically in in white communities, but can be seen in, in uh, uh, black patients that might carry uh, have had some uh, uh, genetic uh, uh, exposure in their backgrounds in their in their uh, in their lineage. So you cannot and you cannot just look go into a SAM room and see a patient that's black or brown and assume that they're having chronic congestion lung disease and that they could not possibly have cystic fibrosis. You need to address them with their symptoms, look at them and become a clinician and a scientist and take better care of them, not put them in an under, um, uh, under-treated, under-diagnosed situation. Now, all of that needs to be taught in medical school. But look at the person, not just uh, through the lens of uh, your, your past, but look at the person through the lens of uh, the current technology and through the person's lived experiences. Thank you. You started your presentation on a slide about social determinants of health. In your strategic plan, there's a Desmond Tutu quote that I love. It says, there comes a point when we need to stop just pulling people out of the river. We need to go upstream and find out why they're falling in. It's so applicable to the upstream drivers of determinants of health. What is the AMA's role in addressing the upstream contributors like systems of power, structural and social drivers? Yeah, I like that quote too. It's one of my favorite ones. And uh, it is important. It is so true. You know, as we try to get our arms around as a society, as a country, as a world, as a planet, at the increasing disease burden, common chronic diseases, uh, well, before we had COVID pandemic, we had a, an epidemic of heart disease, an epidemic of obesity, an epidemic of diabetes and cardiovascular disease. That if it's not unchecked, we're gonna to continue to have more patients than we can possibly provide for. So the burden of disease was already threatening the healthcare system and in fact, adversely affecting health, impacting health e equity well before we had the COVID pandemic. Now that we know about these adverse uh, uh, impacts of chronic disease, we, we really have to take Desmond Tudor's uh, advice, not just pull people out of the river downstream after they're in the organ damage with diabetes, with uh, hypertension, with vascular disease, untreated lung disease, cancer. We need to get back up and figure out how they got it. And we, we, if we look at these determinants of health, uh, they can particularly imp impact marginalized, historically marginalized folks because they don't have access to the same preventive health care that non-marginalized uh, patients had. They, they couldn't necessarily travel to a doctor's office. Many of my patients take an hour to get to me because we're not very densely populated and those that live on the other side of the river literally need to take a ferry or drive a long distance around to get to my practice on, the, on one other side of the river. So transportation, education, uh, access to health care information, access to healthy foods, all those things, medical treatments, that's up, upstream. That's a social determinant of health, not because of their skin color or because of their, who their ancestors were. It's because of the geography of where they are. They can't get on the internet and check on all these things because they don't have broadband. They are hardly getting wireless internet service and where some of my parts of America and some of my parts of my community, all those things are upstream. If we can go back upstream and make that more a part of our common language, part of our application 
of all our resources, we can prevent a lot of health care damage downstream, have people have healthier lives and have uh, an, enough resources to take care of the people that are in the river or near the river anyway before they fall into the river. So speaking of access, <laughs> um, you mentioned, well, COVID brought to light the increased demand on telehealth. Um, and that obviously leaves some populations um, at a disadvantage when it comes to access. How is the AMA helping to bridge the technology divide that continues in this country um, from a wireless access standpoint, equipment, even with wearables and the Internet of Things? You know, there's 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 a gap there. Does the AMA have a role with that, or, or are there any other things that you have ideas about that anybody could apply to help help close that gap? Chante, you're right. Uh, the basic, let's just talk about digital medicine, telehealth. I use that broad term that AMA does too. It's non-traditional healthcare. Before we had the pandemic, a handful of doctors, a handful of providers uh, would use digital health. You know, you can go online, click and get some healthcare advice. But doctors have increased the use of health care from a, maybe 8% using it to 90% of doctors use, using our latest polling. So 90% of doctors are using telehealth. So it's a great benefit to those who had their practices closed, who had to close down during the COVID pandemic and said, hey, I can't take, take you if you're sick because you've got to have testing. You can't come into the lobby. You can't visit your loved ones who are in the hospital. All these extraordinary measures that we had to take to prevent the spread of a highly contagious out of communicable disease for originally, which we had very little treatments. We sure didn't have vaccines, so all of that impacted us. We began using digital health. We would use phone calls, Zoom calls, video calls, FaceTime, all the other things. And so we're, we, we've now learned through the last two years that that's a reasonable uh, uh, alternative to traditional in-person hands-on visits. It, we can get reasonable outcomes for certain diseases, not everything. You can't stitch up a wound or set a broken bone or, or uh, uh, you know, um, Put medicine on a or give an injection into a joint but you can look at people you can get their interview you tell them you know hey that looks like a rash to me or yeah that uh that finger is crooked you're going to have to have an x-ray things like that uh you can get feedback you can you can say hey how you breathing uh, how you feeling fine and then to your point you can use wearable technology heck who would have thought that we could use these things called pulse oximeters which measures your oxygen level then now we send home to any patient or many times have sent home to patients that were diagnosed in our emergency rooms or in offices because they had COVID, we weren't sure of the treatment. We didn't want to hospitalize them. We'd send them home, and if your oxygen level drops below 90, you call us. I mean, that's an incredible technology that we're now using. Across all of that spectrum, though, is the idea that people can access it. Before COVID, uh, we couldn't have our Medicare patients and our Medicaid patients uh, who are on federal health care plans call in or see their health care provider without having a specific location to communicate with. They couldn't do it from the privacy and safety and comfort of their own home. However, with the public health emergency, the federal government, Center for Medicare and Medicaid Services, allowed that to be placed on hold so that my patients in rural Georgetown and Williamsburg County on the coast here where I live could call me or, or set up a telehealth visit, uh, have it uh, documented, get health care, and be covered by their insurance plan, which is important for me as a doctor because it allowed me to keep my practice open. I could still see them and I could document it. And the, the patient's point of uh, service was allowed, even if it's from home, and even with a phone call. So now we, uh, we've we implored Congress and the legislators and uh, regulators to allow that to continue after, after the public health emergency of the COVID pandemic. And we think that's going to happen. As you indicate, not everybody has uh, the ability to get on the Internet or to use this Zoom technology. They haven't had the experience, the lived experience of the uh, education to it. And if they wanted to, they don't have wireless communications in their community. We've asked Congress, and they seem to indicate they want to expand uh, what's called the Connect Act, one of these federal outreach programs that allows uh, all of America to have access to broadband. And that's righteous and just. That should happen. And then finally, your, adv your advice about wearable technology, let's make sure whether it's uh, prenatal monitoring for pregnant moms, make sure whether it's a heart rate monitor, whether it's an oxygen level monitor or a blood sugar monitor, blood pressure monitor, all that is uh, great innovation, but let's make sure it's applied to our marginalized communities so they get the benefits of that. And they may almost preferentially need to be thought about that way because they don't live as close as many folks in America do to a health care institution. Exactly. Exactly. When, when, it, when you mentioned uh, 
monitors and, and people being able to take them home and emergency rooms specifically, what, what popped into my mind was cost. Um, unfortunately, there are too many people that make medical decisions based on what they can afford. Um, in your strategic plan, it says that um, part of it includes improving payment models that advance public health and health equity. The cost of our healthcare system, um, as well as lack of transparency to the cost of services is at the top of my personal list of issues. Um, has the AMA made any inroads in this space yet? And, and what's, what's your plan to help impact payment models, which ultimately translate to the cost for people and their ability to access good service. You're right. We do have a, one of our major initiatives is to improve the payment model for health care, particularly for uh, uh, physicians. Uh, unfortunately, we don't have enough doctors. We didn't have enough doctors in the pipeline. We didn't have enough doctors uh, in, in the uh, maldistributed areas of the country, they tend to populate into geographically congested areas. They don't, uh, doctors, medical school students, because of the cost of medical education being in excess of $200,000, they leave medical school uh, uh, with an MD or DO degree, uh, a mortgage debt without a house, without a place to live. They have to service that debt and they, it, it keeps them, it tends to drive them towards higher uh, paid specialties and distributed in areas where there's uh, more uh, customers, more patients, as it were, where the needs uh, are still great as well. But what we're trying to do is have payment reform. You know, the uh, healthcare payment reform system, healthcare payment system has not uh, improved for physicians over the last 20 years. They've actually lost money over the last 20 years. So what we're looking for is to help incentivize and ask the, the Congress and the payment structure people to incentivize public health, to improve the public health emergency uh, workforce. You know, we lost 40,000 public health workers over the last four years before we had the pandemic. We've had disinvestment in public health infrastructure. People don't go into primary care like I'm in for almost 40 years. They tend to go into, and they don't go into rural South Carolina with it either. You know, they have to, uh, they, they serve from with uh, 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 kind of a, a handicap of debt and burden going forward. So what we're trying to do at the AMA is uh, provide scholarship, provide tuition assistance, provide tax re relief and incentives for graduates of medical institutions uh, who are historically black marginalized communities, so they improve the physician workforce. We incentivize them to go into primary care specialists like mine, pediatrics, family medicine, general internal medicine, to serve rural underserved America, but also urban underserved America, because they're, they're uh, difficult access to healthcare across uh, many domains. And what we're also trying to do is um, allow patients, we, we've had a, a lot of support for the uh, uh, no Surprises Act that Congress recently passed, which you didn't get surprise bills and all from uh, uh, outer network providers and, and, uh, and uh, a narrow network of insurance company. All those things are part of the payment reform structure that helps improve access and puts people in the uh, marginalized communities and healthcare centers in the marginalized communities. So they'll be there for folks to improve their overall health care. Thank you. We're going to take a quick second to do another poll. Our third polling question is, where on the DEI continuum would you describe your organization's progress? Just starting to dip our toes, emerging, on the right path, leading the way, or none of the above? For those of you that would like a copy of today's slides, you can download them from the folder that says slide deck and handouts. We will also be sending the slides via email tomorrow, along with a recording of the webcast. We'll give this question a few more moments. We'll take a look at the results. All right. It's actually pretty, uh, pretty even, but um, 
C came up ahead on the right path, we're focused on internal and external DEI work. Um, A and B were pretty much even, um, just starting to dip our toes and emerging. And a few people are leading the way. So that's, I mean, that's what, um, that's what I would expect. I actually thought B would have been a little bit higher. Um, but what's interesting, and I, I want to say that I appreciate all the comments in the chat around um, why now um, and the need to acknowledge George Floyd. Um, that is when we saw corporations and organizations all over the country um, talking about racial justice. Um, and so if nothing else, um, there, there's no, um, if nothing else, that is one thing that did come out of that. And I think we can't let that uh, murder go in vain. And so even though that's not necessarily health related, it does relate to the, the lack of trust that people have in systems. And so, um, you know, COVID not only, and we're gonna move on to back to the discussion, but COVID um, shined a light on racial disparities related to access and care, but also a light on the lack of trust in the medical industry. And we saw that with resistance to vaccinate. Um, what is the AMA doing regarding combating resistance and building trust? Um, you mentioned that COVID wasn't the only pandemic. There was a pandemic of mistrust <laughs> as well. And I think, you know, I think that that's still, that's still alive and well. Um, what, what not only is the AMA doing, but can some of the providers and organizations that are on this call do to help combat that? Shante, that's right. And I bless you for noticing that. Uh, I, you know, we, since the start of the pandemic, we've been fighting a two front war. We were fighting the, the virus itself. We didn't have vaccines. We weren't sure how to make diagnosis. We didn't have enough testing available. So that's the reason we closed everything down. You didn't know how contagious. You didn't know if there'd be a long COVID or recurrent COVID. And you had uh, limited options. We, we tried all manner of treatments up front. We found what the science would allow us to allow. And something that was uh, inappropriate which should not be allowed and keep people from getting good care. So we had a, a difficult time up front, we just not only with the virus, but then we had a bunch of folks, and many folks reasonably had questions. You know, they, they didn't want uh, to believe that COVID was a serious illness. They didn't want to believe that they uh, needed to get tested. They didn't want to necessarily get the new treatments. They were scared of the vaccines, all those things. And so we had then a, uh, a misinformation campaign from some folks too, who said, hey, don't trust those doctors. Don't trust the CDC, the public health agency, the FDA. There's a, there's a, uh, a bit of a conspiracy behind it. So there was, we were fighting a misinformation, disinformation campaign, as well as the actual virus itself. But I think, you know, if you look back on it, there was probably a bit of lack of confidence to some of our institutions and public health agencies and experts, even before the COVID pandemic started in about two years ago now. And unfortunately, we've had some missteps along the way, but playing the blame game of mixed messaging or lack of adequate supplies, et cetera, that's not gonna get us anywhere. What we need to do is move forward, recognize that the best way to get trust back is to continue to do a good job to be an honest purveyor, a, a, uh, a share of uh, the science, be on the side of science, try to in, uh, improve uh, the conversations we have with our patients, um, engendering trust. One of the things I learned when I was in the military and I had a 35 year military career uh, as a military leader was the way to overcome a lack of trust or confidence, organizational resistance was to continuously demonstrate overwhelming competence. Always do the right thing, always be reliable. Always you know, tell your patient, your customer, your, your military cohorts that you're there for them, that your mission is to make their lives better, to help them. And that's a little bit easier sometimes for a family doctor like myself that takes care of generations. It's a challenge sometimes for public officials that we don't even know are there, though we have a pandemic and a need for them. But we need to understand that if we continually demonstrate a consistent uh, 
side of science, consistently apply science appropriately, react appropriately, and respond appropriately, we can get that trust back. I think people inherently want to trust, want to trust their uh, influence makers in their community. They, they trust their doctors. They trust their healthcare workers in their community. They trust their pharmacists. They trust their ministers. If they're uh, 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 religious like me, they trust their leaders, their elected leaders. That, that's why they elected them. We need to maintain continued expert guidance and continued professionalism. We're going to get back that lost trust. I'm sure we can. I'm pretty, I'm very optimistic about this. Thank you. We have a few minutes left, so we want to get that last polling question in. The final polling question is, which of the following is not part of the AMA's strategic approaches to advance health equity? I'll give everyone a moment to read the answers and make your selection. Once you've completed all CPE requirements, you will be able to download a PDF of your CPE certificate from the CPE progress window. Just give it a bit longer. You can scroll down to hit enter. All right, we'll go ahead and look at the results. Dr. Harmon, would you like to respond to this one? <laughs> Yeah, that's a great idea. Uh, I think we did uh, a pretty good job. This is a real test question, which is kind of interesting. You, it was not just an opinion. I'm thinking, gee, this is a real test question. You have to be paying attention. So I'm impressed that uh, if you look at it, uh, almost half of them got it right. <laughs> There's a few of them. We don't prioritize mental health, but we do the other four things, building alliances, pushing upstream, uh, the other, uh, uh, other five things, as it were. Uh, but we did pretty good. Um, I, I think uh, that's part of what I'm trying to do here today is continually demonstrate that we're serious about it at the AMA with our health equity plan. You've been very perceptive as an audience. Uh, this means we continue to move the message forward and have a good dialogue. And if we're going to advance uh, racial justice and health equity, we're going to have to maintain a, a diligence and a follow-up on our plan. Thank you very much, Shante. Thank you. There, there was one more, um, there was a question in the chat, and I know we're about out of time, but it, we've focused a lot on um, people of color, but we've not really talked about the equity needs in healthcare for LGBTQ+. Do you see that advancing and work specifically focused on that? Because they do have very unique healthcare needs. Guy, great question. In the time I've got remaining, I don't have enough to answer all about it and give you a big perspective, but you're right. We've had a very good uh, response to our educational program about it. I've spoken to LGBTQX uh, leaders in Chicago and nationwide. I've had active conversations. In today's world, electrons are easy to have conversation with, so I haven't had to travel very much, but I've had that very same conversation. First off, we have to destigmatize uh, gender identity immediately, just as we talk about. Uh, words meaning things in our language, we need to destigmatize that so that a, a person who is a uh, LGBTQ X individual that has uh, actively uh, uh, been exposed to potential for HIV disease, the common one of the uh, common uh, chronic ailments, we know that if you have a risk for HIV disease, you need to be on prophylactic treatment. If you get diagnosed with it, you need to be able to go to your doctor, comfortably discuss it without any judgment or or uh, disparaging comments or being in any way discriminated against. All those things are important to us as physicians at AMA. We want to make sure that you understand that if you are identified as an at-risk or a diagnosis of uh, uh, HIV disease and you start treatment immediately, because this is a curable disease or manageable disease if you start early enough with an adequate antiviral regimen. All of that's part of our policy. And also independence. Uh, we want to be able to represent that uh, recommend, uh, recognize that gender-affirming therapy should be appropriate for our folks with uh, 
gender issues. Uh, many physicians sometimes are a little bit, many physicians, but some physicians might be hesitant. Uh, some legislators have actually tried to get involved. We have an advocacy program on state level at AMA so that we don't want anybody to get between a physician-patient relationship. You tipped an iceberg there, but that's important to us too. As I far know. As I know. There's so much to talk about. There's so much to talk about. Thank you so much for your time, uh, Jamie. Um, here is a listing of resources related to today's presentation that you may be interested in. Um, you can access them in the console on your screen, and they will also be included in the presentation slides you will receive tomorrow by email. Thank you, Shante, and thank you, Dr. Herman, for a great discussion today. I also want to thank the audience for being engaged and submitting your questions to help guide today's conversation. If we didn't have time to answer yours, we'll do our best to follow up with you after the webcast. Feel free to reach out to our presenters if you have any additional questions. If you met all CPE requirements, your CPE certificate is available to download in the CPE progress window. I'll keep the webcast console open for a few minutes to give you time to download. A copy will also be emailed within a couple weeks should you have any difficulty now. As a reminder, if you attended today's presentation in a group and would like to receive CPE credit, you must complete the group attendance sheet found in your console. Finally, here is a link to an online survey for today's presentation. Please take a moment to complete the survey as your feedback is very important to us. Thank you for joining our webcast. We hope you'll join us again next time. Thank you, everyone, and thank you, Dr. Harmon. Have a good day. Hey, honor. Just a lot of fun. It was really engaging. Thank you very much. Y'all know how to reach me if you need me. I'll take care. I really appreciate it. Thanks again for being part of the solution to get the word out. Thank you.